So welcome to this introductory podcast in the series on qualitative methods. So as we'll see in this series, qualitative methods are crucial to help gain insight and understanding into the ways in which different groups give meaning to the world around them. It's vital for students to gain a rigorous insight into the theoretical but also practical issues surrounding qualitative methods so that they can practice them effectively. Qualitative methods are also changing. Innovations in visual and oral methods, mobile methodologies and film production, alongside conventional interviews, focus groups and secondary analyses, require students to be responsive to the changing means through which we can understand the world. These rapid innovations raise new issues surrounding plagiarism and ethics, which are often confusing for many practitioners. This set of podcasts will deal directly with these issues. And in this first podcast, we will introduce how we might go about choosing the right methods for our research project. How do we make good decisions about what type of method we should use in our research project? What is the range of methods we might choose from? So this podcast explains how we go about choosing methods and how we go about defending our choice to critical others. Researchers in the social sciences have access to a wide range of research methods at our disposal. They span from the quantitative through to the qualitative. And this breadth of choice, whilst initially appealing, must be handled with care. For choosing inappropriate research methods, ill-suited to the context of our project, will have an impact and on the validity and reliability of the data collected. Essentially, the choice of research methods affects the veracity of our findings. So picking preferred methods and then fitting the research questions around these is definitely not good practice. It's clear that techniques must be selected to meet identifiable research needs. So although it might be tempting just to choose an easy to do method, choosing methods is more than simply about picking the easiest. Rather, it's an issue of choosing the most appropriate method to access the insights and knowledges we require. So what is the knowledge you require? It depends on the questions you want to ask. So what sort of questions do we want to ask? What are, the, what are we interested in finding out? What elements of the social world about the extraordinary relationships between people and place out there are we curious about? So what sort of questions could we ask for our research project? We could ask questions that focus on finding out the frequencies and facts related to social phenomena. For example, we might ask how many people live in an area? What proportion of that population are men and how many are women? How old is that population? How much money do they earn? What gods do they worship? What languages do they speak? How do they live in mortgaged accommodation or do they rent their houses? How do they travel? Where do they travel to? Where do they work? How are they employed? What employment in sectors are growing or declining? Who do they vote for? What are their attitudes to Europe? Do they want to be part of the Eurozone, yes or no? This first set of questions helps us to find out about the frequencies and facts of the social world. However, we could also ask different types of questions, trying to find out about different aspects of the world in which we live. For example, we could ask, what makes people happy? What nationality means to a certain group of people? How do you feel to be British, Irish or Welsh? Why do you vote the way you do? Why might people want to protect their local area? What sort of ice cream flavour do people prefer and why? So this set of questions is not interested in facts and frequencies, but more interested in why people do what they do, how they explain their actions, their practices and their life histories. So there's lots of different questions we can ask about the extraordinary relationships between people and place. And now let's think about the ways we could answer these questions. Each set of questions we've introduced asks for a different type of answer. Some might require us to answer with numbers or choose from a preordained, limited set of options. We could answer with single words, with short sentences. We may even need to use long explanations. We could use diaries, pictures, or perhaps even film. The key issue then is to ask the right question to get the right information that we need to choose the correct sort of methods to get the right art to ask the right sort of data to get the right sort of answers. So the first set of questions we introduced was interested in the frequencies and facts of social life. These are often asked using methods that are quantitative in nature. 
Perhaps the most popular and well-known quantitative method is the survey. Most of us will have been asked to fill in a survey at some stage of our lives, either in person, through a cold calling on the telephone, or by an intercept issue in the street or shopping centre. Surveys may be used to gain insight into customer service satisfaction, but also about related social demographics through the census, for example. In a survey, the interviewer asks all respondents the same series of pre-established questions. There's generally, generally little room for variation, with each question asked in exactly the same way, and respondents have to answer within a limited set of response categories. This structure is useful as it permits comparability between responses from the sample group, and perhaps with other sample groups in other spaces. Then, as with most quantitative data methods, the results are aggregated, patterns might be analysed and causes and effects discovered. In this way, surveys can be used on a large scale to generate a general representativeness for a wider population. The survey method therefore gives us general facts and frequencies. It helps us to look for patterns in the social world and allows us to describe the general situation with regard to a particular phenomenon. Surveys then are particularly good for generating knowledge about general conditions. However, they are a bit less useful for giving specific explanations in individual circumstances. Perhaps, therefore, we can think of surveys giving the bird's eye view, a view from a satellite, a broad brush understanding of the world, the view from afar. But perhaps we need more detailed understandings, and we can perhaps explore those at a later date. However, this quantitative method although it gives us the bird's eye view, is not so appropriate for answering the second set of questions we introduced earlier. That set, if you remember, was interested in the meanings and interpretations that individuals have about the world. Here's an example to demonstrate what I mean, and this is taken from the work of Jill Valentine. So Jill Valentine uses the example of a survey about chocolate consumption to show how the survey doesn't always allow individuals to give accurate and personal information about their own particular circumstances. The survey she filled in asked the following questions. Question one, how many items of chocolate do you, each, do you eat each week? Ring an answer. So question two, where do you buy most of your chocolate? In the supermarket, in a newsagent, in a vending machine, or other? Question three, how much chocolate do you eat relative to other forms of confectionery? Using the scale below, identify the response which best reflects your opinion. So Valentine uses the example of chocolate consumption to illustrate some of the limitations of a survey approach for the sort of knowledge she was interested in. In answering question one, she said she didn't actually want to pick a number, but she wanted to ask, well, what do you actually mean by chocolate? Do you mean chocolate cake, chocolate milkshake, or just chocolate bars? She also wanted to say, well, I don't regularly eat fixed amounts of chocolate. My consumption varies according to season, mood, access to a shop, etc. So as she puts it, the survey does not allow me to explain my experiences, whereas an interview might allow me to express all the complexities and contradictions that are inherent within my chocolate eating habits and perhaps within everyone's lives. So surveys in asking a rigid set of simple questions often pushes respondents into particular categories which they may not have thought about unprompted or may indeed not want to use. So as a consequence, as Valentine argues, surveys are not tailored to individual circumstances. So for more in-depth material beyond numbers and short one-word answers, we need a different set of research methods. If we want to get at lived experience by asking questions like, how do you feel about the world? What do you think about it? What are your views on particular subjects? We need a method to be more tailored to individuals, context and circumstance. In this situation, we need to use more qualitative methods. And that's what the next podcast in this series will turn to look at.